All right. Welcome, everyone. I see that people are slowly joining the session today. Thank you for joining us. I want to give a warm welcome to all of our alumni of the University of Michigan. I'm Brooklyn Posler, and I'm the Associate Director of the Alumni Career Program. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. I see we're already over 100 attendees joining. Um, we had a lot of registrants for today's session, well over 600 alumni. So as we wait for some of those attendees to join us, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping notes before we get started. This is an interactive webinar that is being recorded. The recording will be shared in a follow-up email and will be posted to our video library on our website. You'll get an email tomorrow letting you know when this is available. Please submit questions for our speaker through the Q&A feature in your toolbar. We received a ton of questions for today's session and we'll do our very best to get to yours, but it is possible we may not get to them all. Some questions we received were about career changes not related to the resume. So while we won't be diving into those today, we'll be sharing resources related to these both in the chat and in our follow-up email. The chat feature is also active. Please feel free to participate in the discussion with other participants throughout the session in the chat section. So to kick us off in the chat section, please let us know where you're joining us from. I'm here today in Ann Arbor, Michigan with my colleague, Haley Briggs, the Associate Director of our Alumni Education Program. Haley, do you wanna go ahead and introduce our speaker for today? Yes, thank you, Brooke. I am happy to be here today with you all, and we are very excited and very grateful to have Tristan Layfield with us as we delve into our topic, Mastering Your Resume for Your Career Change. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about Tristan. So Tristan Layfield is the owner and principal career coach and resume writer at Layfield Resume Consulting, which has helped over 1,250 people identify and leverage their unique value proposition to transition their careers. His practice, rooted in personal Personal leadership and self-advocacy helps empower job seekers to effectively communicate their value to attract their ideal jobs and employers. With his work featured on major platforms such as LinkedIn, Business Insider, Black Enterprise, and The Muse, Tristan aims to help job seekers build professional brands that transform their mindsets, advance their careers, and expedite their job searches. So with that, I will turn it over to Tristan. Tristan, take it away. Thank you so much, Haley and Brooke, and I really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get the presentation shared here for us. Um, give me just one second. But as I do that, I want to briefly just say um, thank you. Hold on just a moment. My, my share doesn't want to work with us today. So give me just a second. Perfect. So as, the, as they said, we are going to talk a little bit today about mastering your resume for your career change. And so in talking about that, before we do, I just want to make sure you guys know a little bit more about me. So as they said, my name is Tristan Layfield. I've helped quite a few people land the roles that they've been seeking. I'm a 2010 graduate of the University of Michigan, and I've been a hiring manager for Fortune 500 companies across retail, tech, biotech, and the consulting space. Um, and so before we even jump into the presentation today, I just think it's very important that we decide to just say a quick go blue. Congratulations to the boys. Congratulations to us. Yes, the championship, right? Um, so I, I think we couldn't start this presentation without starting there. Um, now, I want to quickly ask you to let me know in the chat what year you graduated. I just want to know a little bit more about the people that are here. We got quite a few years. I see some 2006, 94, 2011. We got quite a few people inside of here all over. Okay, we have, we have alums from all different years inside of the space. And so I'm really glad that you all decided to join us today. And so let's jump into what we are going to be talking about. So first, I think it's incredibly important that we get aligned on what a resume is. We don't all have the same definition of a resume, so I wanna make sure we get on the same page. We're also gonna talk about what's included in a resume, including talking a little bit about the formatting and where things should show up inside of the document. We are going to even talk a little bit about optional sections. Okay, Elizabeth, I see you say you're finishing your PhD this semester. Congratulations. 
Um, we're also going to talk about what not to include, because that's just as important. We're going to talk about some common resume questions that we tend to get, and then identifying keywords. Many of you guys probably know you're going through what's called an applicant tracking system. And so it's incredibly important that we know how to identify those keywords for that system. And we're going to get into some specific tips for career changers here. Um, yes, Troy, uh, I'm talking in a bubble in Zoom. Uh, it's an update on the Sonoma uh Mac OS. So please go ahead and check it out on YouTube. It's not that hard to do. <laughs> now, let's go into talking a little bit about what exactly is a resume. So when I think of a resume, I think of it as a marketing document or an informational sales pitch, right? When we are on the job search, we are a product. And we are selling that product to potential employers. And so we have to make sure that we are highlighting the value that we bring to those companies or organizations or that we have brought to previous companies and organizations, right? So all too often, we get caught up in listing tasks where we get caught up in just telling people what the job was rather than highlighting the results or the impact or the accomplishments that we had inside of the space, right? When we think about things like, let's just say an iPhone, right? In October, when Apple does its uh, does its yearly sort of release of iPhones, they don't just come on and say, oh, it has a 12.3 inch screen and it takes pictures. You should buy it, it makes calls, right? They come in and tell you it has the 12.3 inch screen, it has a 15 megapixel camera, it has this, it has these, it has this feature, right? They're selling you on the value you could get as a consumer. And so we wanna make sure that we are doing the exact same thing. Now, we also wanna remember that a resume is a tool to get an interview, not a job. Oftentimes people think a great resume is the thing that gets you a job, but no, a resume is the thing that helps you get your foot in the door. And you need to be able to speak to those things inside of the resume. And the, thing, the reason I like to say this is because sometimes we often seek help with our resumes, right? We'll have somebody come and ask, we'll have somebody read it, we'll have somebody maybe write it on our behalf, but we need to speak to those things inside of the interview in order to sell ourselves. So remember that. And then the last thing you wanna remember is that a resume is a living document. And so for those of you who don't know what that means, it is something that should be ever changing. You are constantly evolving, you are constantly changing. And with that, your resume should be changing as well. As you gain new skills, new experiences, the opportunity to work on new projects, we need to be updating our document on a regular basis. Now, before you write a resume, you have to get incredibly clear on what you want to do and who you're writing it for. Now, why do you think that is? If you want to pop in the chat, why do you think we need to get incredibly clear on what you want to do and who you are writing it for? Anybody, any guesses? Why do we want to get clear on that? Who are you selling to? Absolutely, Robert, right? If we're talking about a marketing document, Tailoring language, 100%, Alicia, speaking to the audience. Yes, you guys are right on point, right? We have to speak to the right audience. If you aren't clear, your message isn't going to be clear. They aren't going to know who you're speaking to and the results that you can create, right? The other reason we need to get incredibly clear is because of these three little letters, right? And that stands for Applicant Tracking systems. So before you can ever get to a human to see your document, you're more than likely going to be going through what's called an applicant tracking system. Recent studies show that 70% of all companies and organizations and up to 98% of all Fortune 500 companies utilize applicant tracking systems. So we need to know how to get past those things. We need to know how to format our documents in a way that those systems can read it and find those keywords that are going to tell them that we are the best candidate. Now, how long do you think a recruiter looks at your resume before deciding if you'll move to the next step? How long do you think they, they take with your resume? 30 seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, 10 seconds. Some of you guys are spot on. Some of you guys are, are giving them a little bit more than they actually uh, might give you. The answer here is eight to 10 seconds on average. So they scan left to right, top to bottom for about eight to 10 seconds. And so this has some incredible consequences for you as a job seeker, right? So what this means for you is that the top two thirds of your resume is incredibly important. 
we should be getting to relevant information quickly. We should not be burying the lead later in our document. And the other piece, as I've said previously, is that we have to infuse those keywords to make sure that we are speaking to the system and to the recruiter or hiring manager that might be scanning your document. Does it depend on industry, Alicia? Yes, it depends, honestly, it depends on the individual person, honestly, right? There are some people who will spend more time. There are some people who simply will open a document, see it's three and a half pages and not spend any time with it, right? So it really just depends on the industry, but overall on average, it's about eight to 10 seconds. The other thing that that means for you is that you have to select and create a format that stands out. But the key here is that the format still needs to be read by the applicant tracking systems. So if you've ever um, Googled resume formats or you maybe you've gone on Etsy or any other places that, that might have resume formats that you can potentially purchase, you might see those cute formats that have the little bars that tell you how good someone is at a skill or whatever the case may be those tend to get caught up in those applicant tracking systems. Many applicant tracking systems have issues reading images and graphics. Also things like bars, quantifying your skills are unnecessary, right? If one skill is 100% and another one's 75, a recruiter's gonna look and say, why are you trying to sell me subpar skills, right? So we need to create a format that represents us well, but is also able to be read by the applicant tracking system. Hate ATS, Matthew. I get it. I, I hate ATS as well. And yes, Aisha, the federal government does have its own type of formatting. So this is speaking more to industry rather than government roles here. But if you are interested in government roles, we can talk a little bit one-on-one um, -on, -one on what that looks like, and I'll tell you how later. Now, there are some small details that are incredibly important inside of your resume. If somebody's spending eight to 10 seconds with your document, we need to be consistent in the way we're formatting things because we need to guide their eyes through that document. And so what I mean by consistency in formatting is that if you bold one job title, all your job titles should be bolded, right? If you have your dates right aligned, all your dates should be right aligned. If you have bullet points, make sure all your bullet points are aligned, right? Be consistent. Number one, it makes your document visually pleasing, but number two, it guides people's eyes to find the information that they need. Um, now, spelling and grammar as well, these are incredibly important because 61% of recruiters disqualified candidate due to typos. So yes, we can utilize things like Grammarly, which is a great tool that catches more than just spelling, looks at your grammar, looks at your word usage and your syntax and all that. But ultimately, the gold standard here is to have someone else review your document, right? Now, let's jump into what to include on your resume. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is what we call the header. And I wanna be very specific here. This is not when you're in Microsoft Word and you click at the top and you see a little header and you can put something in there that goes on every single page after that. We don't wanna use that header in Microsoft Word. Oftentimes applicant tracking systems have issues reading headers and footers of documents. So we want to make sure that we create our own header in the body of the document. And actually you can go ahead in Microsoft Word, if you're proficient inside of there, you can go ahead and reduce the size of the headers and footers to give you a little bit more space back inside of your document. But when I speak to headers here in relation to a resume, we are speaking to what's at the top of the document. And yes, that says Beyonce Knowles Carter. No, I did not do a resume for her. Just had to de-identify this document and I did it right before I was heading to the Beyonce concert. But um, I do see some questions real quick. You say, uh, what's the best place to find a good resume template? In all honesty, I'm more of an advocate of creating your own template on Microsoft Word rather than buying templates off the internet, um, you know, simply because you can oftentimes create a better one, honestly, inside of Word. But um, also you don't know what's sort of embedded in that document that might get you caught up in applicant tracking systems. Um, someone says, if there's an ATS, why do we still need to fill out all the online forms after we upload our resumes? Great question. That's because sometimes you provide a resume format or a document format that the system cannot adequately read. And so what companies have done is they put a fail safe in place that 
that requires you to put the information in. So that way, if the applicant tracking system can't adequately scan your document, they use the text version that you put inside of the application to scan to see if you are a good fit, right? Um, is it worth having a fancier resume with boxes and bars to hand to an interviewer person or just stick with the ATS optimized version? That's a great question. Um, I say that if you wanna have a more visually appealing resume, I would go ahead and do that as long as you are handing it directly to a person or you are emailing it directly to a person. But I would stick to more of the streamlined document anytime you're uploading to any type of systems, simply because we wanna make sure that you are getting your document read here. Now, when we look at the header piece, there's some key information that you wanna make sure that you have. You wanna make sure you have your first and your last name, right? Now, your middle initial is optional. I like to include it, it makes it seem a little bit more formal. Um, you wanna make sure that you have your email address and we wanna make sure we have a professional email address. So, you know, it should be some play off of your name. I often recommend that you actually create an email address simply for your job search because you don't want to actually find yourself in a situation where a very good offer is sandwiched between some promotions and you don't see it, right? If you create an email that's simply for your job searches, you know that every communication there is important and needs to be read and needs to be responded to most likely, right? The other thing we want is your phone number. Now notice this is not email or phone number, it's email and phone number. Now the amount of resumes that I get that have one or the other is egregious. Um, we wanna have both of them. We wanna make it easy for a recruiter to contact us. And so we just wanna have everything ready to go. City, city, state, and zip code. Now, we do not have to have our full address in our documents anymore. And honestly, we shouldn't want to anyway, simply because our documents are going online, they're being distributed into many hands. We don't want some random creeper showing up to our house. City, state, and zip code is enough. The reason that we want that there, though, is because some jobs do proximity-based searches based on city names that may be in the document. So we want to make sure we have the city, state, and zip code. Next is your LinkedIn URL. If you have a LinkedIn, you want to add your LinkedIn URL. A recent study shows that resumes with LinkedIn URLs have a 71% higher chance of landing an interview than those without one. And then the other thing that is optional for some of you who are career changers, you may actually want to be relocating. Um, and so if you want to relocate, you want to make sure that you explicitly state that inside of your document. And the header space is a great place to do that. So you can either say willing to relocate, or you can say re relocating to whatever city and state by whatever date, right? Um, if you say this relocating to, let's say, Chicago, Illinois by April 2024, now you have Chicago, Illinois in your resume, whether you live there or not. And that will help you if there are proximity-based keywords for Chicago, Illinois, that the applicant tracking system is looking for. So it's a nice way to sort of get around those things. Now, the next section is, it's the only optional section that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about here. Um, it's the summary. Now, some of you may have what's called objectives on your resume, and we're gonna talk a little bit about objectives later, but I prefer that we bring a summary into the document. It's typically the thing that follows your header section. Now, we don't want your summary to be incredibly long. We are writing an autobiography here, right? So three to five lines max is what I tend to stick to. And then we're not talking about sentences because that can still be an incredibly long paragraph. We're talking about lines on the document. So count them. We want it to be short, sweet and to the point. We wanted to highlight the skills that are transferable to where you're trying to go and anything that makes you stand out, right? Your unique value proposition, the thing that sets you apart from everybody else that may be applying for the job. So really take that time to tell the reader about you and your career. Now, I do see some, can you share a link to opti ATS Optimize examples? We'll talk a little bit about that and how you can get some of that for me later. Thoughts on including credentials. We're gonna get to that in just a second. Is it better to use your university email on your resume or your personal email? Um, Steven, that's going to really depend on where you're applying to, but honestly, I don't think it's going to be, it's going to harm you either way, as long as it's a, pro a professional email, um, you know, it's not something like, you know, coldboy89 at yahoo.com, um, as long as it's something that's a playoff of your name, either or is going to be completely fine. 
city, state sufficient, no zip code, that would be completely fine as well, Robert. Um, so I wanna make sure that we keep going. We'll have some time for more questions a little bit later. The next section that we're gonna really touch on is education, right? So in the education section, you'll notice in this document, it's actually all the way at the bottom. And I do that strategically for a couple of reasons and we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, but you'll notice in the education section, there's a couple of things that I like to make sure are listed. First, we wanna make sure your degree title is listed. We wanna make sure that the, your focus or major is listed. Yes, you can also include minors. You wanna include that the university, include the university that you graduated from or college that you graduated from. Now, your graduation date is optional. And I say that for a couple of reasons. So number one, just so you be clear, you don't endorse all the lines under on Beyonce's resume, right? No, I don't, I don't endorse all the lines on Beyonce's resume at this point in time. Um, now, with that education, like I said, graduation date is optional simply because we sometimes want to fend off age discrimination. Some people may utilize a graduation date to try and calculate your age. And even though we know that that is something that is illegal, we can't always prove that that's something that's been done. And so one way that people try to thin that off is by removing their graduation date. And that happens on both ends of the spectrum, people who've recently graduated and people, people who graduated years ago, right? So if you feel uncomfortable or you think that might be a factor inside of your job search, feel free to re remove that graduation date. Now, another thing that people ask about often is GPA. Now, GPA is usually not required, and I say usually because there are some jobs that may ask for that. If they ask for it, then fine. But for the most part, I would only consider using it if I am a new graduate. After you really get that first job inside of your field, you can go ahead and remove that GPA, or you can simply just not include it in the first resume at all, unless the company requests that you include that here, okay? Thank you for sharing that uh, resource on ages in Brooklyn. Now, the next section that I like to bring in is a skills or expertise section. You'll notice this right under a uh, the summary here. And the reason that I like to bring this in is because number one, it can serve as a place for you to play around with depending on the type of job that you're applying to. So sometimes you need to highlight different skills for different roles you're applying to so you can switch them in and out here. The other reason that I like to include this is because it serves as a one-stop shop for a recruiter or hiring manager who's scanning your document, right? If they're scanning it for eight to 10 seconds, they're much more likely to pick up the, the things that you're bringing with you from the skills and expertise section than having to pull those out of the experience section. Section, um, as they are scanning, right? So I like to utilize it for that very reason. Um, now, the one thing I want to make sure we, we understand is we are not listing every skill we have here right? We are listing the top nine to 12 relevant skills to where we're trying to go, right? We don't want to list anything that's irrelevant in this section. We want to maximize our use of space here. Too many people exaggerate their skills in the skills section. Well, Troy, what I will tell you is that is up to the employer to figure out and determine if their uh, skill level is up to par for what they're seeking. I, um, I, on the flip side, we can also talk about how many companies exaggerate on their job descriptions, right? So um, either way, it's also on then the job seeker to figure out and really suss that out as well. We also want to focus on the hard skills, right? We can often get caught up in what, what we like to call the soft skills, right? Um, the things like teamwork or dedicated or, uh, you know, things like that, that don't really tell me the type of work that you're able to do for a company or organization. Um, and so with that, you wanna make sure you focus on the hard skills. As you can see, this person was in uh, training design. And so we talked about training needs assessments. We talked about project management, different things like organizational development. Um, so with that, you wanna make sure these things are once again, focused on where you wanna go. Unfortunately, Selma, no, I don't have a list of skills for you to use because that's gonna be incredibly dependent on the industry, the job, the company. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're looking inside of the job descriptions to really identify the skills that are important to them that you may have. 
Next is your work experience. Now, this is the bulk of your resume, right? Now, a couple of things you'll notice inside of this resume that each one of the jobs have. Every job has a job type, right? You'll see that here in bold. Every job also has a company name, right? And I always like to leave with the job title versus the company name. Job titles give a people a better understanding of the type of work that you've done for that company, right? If I list that I worked at Apple, people are automatically going to assume that I either worked at the Genius Bar on the Mall or I'm a software engineer, but I could be a director of marketing for Apple. So by leading with the title, it gives people a better understanding of your work. Then I leave with the then I go with the company name, and you'll see that all the dates that we have are right aligned, meaning they are on the right side of the document. That is where recruiters and hiring managers like to see those dates. Now, if they're if they're not there, it doesn't mean that it's going to fully disqualify you, but that's where they like to see them because it easily allows them to see how long you were inside of those roles and if there were any gaps inside of your document, which we'll speak to later. The other thing you'll notice about those dates is that every date has a month in a year, right? And so we wanna make sure we add months and years. And if you just had dates that said 2017 to 2018, that could be two days, or that could be two years, right? So when recruiters and hiring managers see that, they often start to ask, what is the person hiding, right? So if you don't have anything to hide, you definitely want to make sure you bring those months into your resume. One thing you'll also notice is I like to make sure that our descriptions are always in bullet points. Oftentimes you'll see in some uh, formats where they have a paragraph, a leading paragraph, and then a couple of bullet points after. I tend to stay away from paragraph form on the resume outside of your summary, right? Uh, uh, the summary should be the only paragraph that we see simply because we know that when there are paragraphs and people are scanning, they look at the first line, they look at the last line and everything in the middle tends to get lost. So we wanna make sure that we are appealing to the psychology of the human brain. When we actually utilize bullet points, it, uh, it makes our brain want to stop at each one of those bullet points and read them. So it actually forces people to read a little bit more of your document, even though they are scanning. Now, one of the biggest things with your experience is your bullet points. And this is oftentimes where people have the biggest issue when it comes to writing their resumes. And so I actually use an acronym called ARV, right? Action, Reason, Value, right? And so we want to tell them the action you took, the reason you took it, and the value we provided the company, organization, client, whomever, right? Now, Oftentimes, what you'll see inside of many resumes is most people just stop at the action they took, right? It tells me the task, but it doesn't go any further, right? And so if we just stopped at the action in this bullet point and say, organized inventory room. Now that is short, it is sweet, but it doesn't give me any value. And when you work at a company or organization, you know more when you've organized an inventory room, right? So if you've organized it, you know it has 300 plus items. If you are in a sales organization, you can look at the sales the next week and see, oh, well, our sales have increased a bit, right? You might even have some productivity trackers in the work that you're doing, and you can see that productivity increased because people were able to find the items quicker and get them out on the floor to be sold, right? But if you know those things, why aren't they in your bullet points, right? Numbers are the thing that sell you as a candidate most times. Now, there are some industries and spaces where numbers aren't always the most available, but that doesn't mean you didn't provide value or you didn't have results. Sometimes you need to be a little bit more wordy about those things. But let's take this example for a moment. If we were to rewrite this to include the action, reason, and value, you want to say something like organize a stock room with 300, 300 plus items, providing a 20% productivity increase, resulting in a 5% growth in sales. Right? Or you can say, grew sales by 5% by organizing a stock room with 300 plus items, which provided a 20% increase in productivity. Or you can even go with increased productivity by 20% and grew sales by 5% by organizing a stock room with 300 plus items. Right? So those are three different ways to write the same information. And the, way that I, the reason I wanna present those three different ways to you is because you're going to present that information differently depending on the type of job that you're applying to, right? If you're applying to a, an inventory management heavy job, you might wanna start with organize a stock room of 300 plus items. If you're gonna be applying to a sales job, 
you probably want to start with group sales by 5%. If you're going to be going into a consulting role, you might want to start with increased productivity by 20% and sales by 5%, right? So we want to consider the type of roles that we're applying to and how we structure our bullet points and our sentences, um, right? And their resume guide in Alumni Center is Action Context Results. So it's the same intended goal, just a different acronym. Thank you so much, Brooklyn, for putting that in there. Now, somebody did ask, what if you don't know or can't quantify impact? then I would say that you aren't doing a good job of keeping track of what you've done over the years or what you've done in your role. Um, I would really look to how are you filling out your annual reviews? How are you showing them that you created results? What goals or what metrics are you being held to by your boss? Those are the things you want to consider when we're thinking about value or impact or results. There is always some type of impact. There's always some type of value, always some type of results that you create as an employee. You just might not be looking in the right places. So you want to make sure that you try to find that because that's the thing that sells you as a candidate. Um, now, somebody also asked, um, what did they say? What if value isn't easy to quantify? We talked about that. What if you're self-employed? That value is difficult because the client has that information. Well, Carol, I think one of the things that you want to do is build in feedback loops with your clients to get more information on the value that was provided, right? Um, the other thing that you might want to do is institute something like CFAT scores, like client satisfaction scores that you could potentially start to include as well, right? So if you're working um, in a client-based business, odds are you're probably gonna be looking to do some client-based work for a company. And so things like CFAT scores or the number of clients that you've had in your portfolio, those things are gonna be very useful as well. Now, We've gotten through all the main sections of your resume. I do wanna quickly touch on some optional sections that you can bring in, but the key here in remembering these optional sections is that these things should only be utilized if they are relevant to the job, right? We do not put information on our resumes simply for the sake of putting them on our resume, right? We wanna make sure that the things that we are presenting are relevant to what we're trying to do. Now, the first thing is what I like to call additional experience. So sometimes we have older roles that we don't want to fully take off because we want to show the trajectory of our career. Or sometimes we have roles that aren't the most relevant to what we're trying to do. So you can have what's called an additional experience section, which you'll see down here, where you list the title, the company, and the dates, but they don't have any description. That will allow you to do two things. Number one, it allows you to still show that trajectory. Or number two, it allows you to focus on the most relevant experience up here while also not having gaps inside of your experience on your resume, right? It shows the recruiter or hiring manager that you did have work experience during those times that might not be shown. What I would also do if you were using the additional experience for um, roles that might not be the most relevant, I would title this top section relevant professional experience. And then I just titled this additional experience. But this is a great way to bring space back into your document. The other thing is leadership and professional development. So you can actually create a leadership and professional development section and you would treat it very similar, similar to how you would a uh, experience section. So you would have some type of title, company or organization, dates you did this leadership or professional development, and the things you learned or the results or the value you provided throughout those times, right? So let's just say you participated in a certificate program uh, to learn more about coding and you did some projects that you really were excited about and you're trying to get into that space. You could actually put your coding boot camp inside of this leadership and professional development section, uh, put the coding boot camp name as the company name, the dates you were in that boot camp, and then describe Describe the projects you worked on, the results or the value it provided. Another thing is certifications and licenses. I'm going to lump these two together. Um, someone asked a question about credentials. You can bring these in absolutely if they're relevant. They can have their own section. So sometimes people do certifications and licenses. Sometimes people break them up if they have tons of certifications and licenses. Or if people are looking to save space, sometimes they condense this with education, certifications, and licenses. Right. So it really depends on your unique situation, how you're going to represent that. But you can absolutely bring those into the document. 
Next is a project section. So sometimes we work on projects that aren't tied to any work experience, but are relevant to the type of work that we're looking to do, right? So let's just say you are somebody who, um, you know, wants to go into entertainment nonprofit, uh, excuse me, entertainment marketing, but you currently do marketing for a nonprofit, right? But you helped a friend develop a social media marketing strategy for their new podcast, right? You would create a project section. Your title would be social media marketing manager. Your, your company would be your friend's podcast name. The dates would be the date you worked on the project. And then you add a couple bullet points on what your roles and responsibilities were and the results you created, right? So this is a great way to bring on relevant experience that isn't tied to the work experience that you have, especially if you're trying to change your career, right? That can be a great tool for you. Next is volunteer experience. Now, 10, 15 years ago, volunteer experience used to be something that was incredibly important to companies and organizations, that you had some tie to the community. Um, but unfortunately, as we become a more globalized um, sort of space when it comes to work, many of the companies and organizations aren't as concerned about your ties to, to the community. So what I often tell people here is volunteer experience should simply be brought on if this is relevant to the work that you're trying to do, or it could be brought on if it's relevant to the philanthropic efforts of the company you're applying to, right? So be mindful of that. Next is professional affiliations. So professional affiliations would be, uh, come, uh, excuse me, professional organizations that you're involved in, right? So um, if you are a nurse and you're involved in the American Nursing Association, you're a member, you want to make sure you bring those things in. And then the last thing is honors or awards. Any honors or awards that you've received in the last three to five years is what I would bring onto your resume. If they aren't within the last three to five years, you start to open yourself up to questions. People start to ask, well, you received awards for your work five, six, seven, eight years ago, and haven't received anything since. Has the quality of your work declined, right? So we don't want to find ourselves inside that situation. Um, Next thing, Troy says, if you have projects that overlap your full-time job, would that concern hiring managers? There's a possibility of that. The way that I would simply avoid that is to simply not put dates on the project. I just put the title, the company or organization I did it for, and the bullet points there. Is it important to include awards slash honors from school? I would include an award slash honors from school inside of your education section and only if they are relevant, right? So if you are somebody who's going to be staying in academia, then the awards and honors you get from school are gonna be incredibly important and I would add them inside of your education section. Beyond then, being quite frank with you in corporate America, it's not going to mean too much, being frank. Now, what not to include in your resume? The first thing is objectives. Objectives are outdated. They all boil down to, I want the job, right? So we want to move more to summaries that allow us to sell our unique value proposition. Next, interests or hobbies. Now, some career centers will tell you to bring interests and hobbies on your resume, and I get it. It's about showing people that you're uh, more than just your work, that you're a whole person, and allow the opportunity for people to connect with you. I personally do not like to include them simply because as much as we would like to believe that we are non-judgmental or hiring managers will be non-judgmental, recruiters will be non-judgmental, the fact is we are fairly judgmental when it comes to that, right? So if there are things in there that they think are a waste of time or stupid or they just don't get, right? That could be open you, opening you up to unnecessary scrutiny for something that isn't relevant to the job. Now, if your interests or hobbies are relevant to the job, I'm not gonna fight you, please add them by all means, right? If you are trying to be a software engineer and you participate in hackathons every single weekend, sure, by all means, I'm not gonna fight it. But I would argue most of our interests and hobbies are not related to the work that we're looking to do. References available upon request. We do not need that on the document. It is assumed that if a company or organization will ask you for references, you will provide them. So I just recommend that you have a references sheet with all of your references information, and you can provide it at any point in time when a company or organization requests that. Next is your personal pronouns. I, me, and my do not belong in a resume. Now, personally, I don't like this rule, but I just enforce them. Um, the thought is your resume is about you. There's no reason to include I, me, or my throughout the document. So you talk about yourself like you're not even there. Next is pictures, images, and graphics. 
we don't want any pictures on our document of us and all those things, number one, because they can get caught up in the applicant tracking system. But number two is because we can open ourselves up to unnecessary criticism and discrimination, right? We don't want to include that type of information there. It is not required in any way, shape or form. Next is personal identifying information. Social security number, height, weight, age, date of birth, marital status, sex, ethnicity, race, do not belong on your resume here in the United States. Now, I know that there are some people that are um, abroad, and in some countries, some of this information is actually commonplace on a resume. So if you're applying in the United States, it is not. Most of these are protected classes, and so you don't want to include those things. But if you're applying outside of the United States, if you're applying abroad, then I would make sure to look at that country's standards when it comes to this personal identifying information. Um, somebody says, how many references should you provide when not quantified by a recruiter? Three to five, Brooklyn, absolutely, that is the answer I would provide as well. We're going to talk about resume length in just a moment. Um, next, and the last thing I say you shouldn't include on your resume is lies. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. It may not catch up with you now, but it could catch up with you later, right? Um, we also, I'm in Michigan, we're in at-will state, meaning that companies and organizations can literally let you go at any point for any reason. So if they do uncover a lie, they could let you go. Also in many states that are not at-will states, there are laws in the books that allow many companies and organizations to use your hiring information for years beyond hiring you um, if you were to have lied on that application. So, you know, just simply try to avoid that lying piece. It's not really going to help you. Now, some common resume questions, and these are some of the things you guys were asking. How long should your resume be, right? Now, the typical, typical conventional wisdom is going to be one page, if possible, right? And it makes sense. Think about it. Somebody's scanning your page, your resume for eight to 10 seconds. The more information we have, the harder it's going to be for them to get the information that they're looking for. But there is recent research that shows that um, two-page documents are seen much more positively by recruiters and hiring managers than they used to be. So two-page documents are not the end of the world, but if you are going onto a second page, it needs to be the most relevant content to where you're trying to go. We do not want to go into a second page for the sake of going onto a second page, right? So be mindful of that. You want to try to get down to one page if possible. If you are more than 10 to 15 years in your career, a two-page resume is not going to be uh, you know, a, a, the biggest deal breaker for your job search. I've created plenty of them for clients and we've been completely successful in getting them into roles. Now, how far back should your resume go? Typically about 10 to 15 years back, that is the conventional wisdom that you're going to get. Our skills and our experience age over the years. And so 10 to 15 years back, you know, things change, how we do that, the systems change, the regulations change. So 10 to 15 years is typically the conventional wisdom. Um, now, even as an, at an executive level, Claire, that's a great question. It does change a bit at the executive level. Oftentimes when you're trying to go into VP or C-suite levels, they want to sort of see the full depth of your experience. So this is gonna be more for entry, mid, sort of, you know, mid, maybe moving into senior level roles. But once we get into executive, they're probably going to want to see more information there. Now, real quick, the last couple of things we're gonna to touch on is identifying keywords and some tips for you career changers. Now, what are keywords, right? There's specific abilities skills, expertise, and traits that, that tell people the type of work that you're able to do, their qualifications for a job. When I think about keywords, there's a couple ways that you can find these things. So I typically, I'll, 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 I typically ask people what, what keywords are inside here, but we're a little short on time. So I'm going to skip this and just talk about how to identify keywords. First, I say utilize AI, right? Many companies and organizations are utilizing computer systems to weed you out. Why not utilize computer systems to try to find your way in, right? So on the screen, you're gonna see a prompt. Don't worry, we're going to give you a resource guide that has quite a few AI prompts inside of it that you can utilize. So you don't have to break your hands trying to type or write it, um, but you can utilize this prompt, copy and paste the job description and utilize that AI system to identify the keywords and phrases and areas of expertise that you can try to incorporate inside of your resume to be seen. Thank you, Brooklyn, for putting that link uh, of the resources inside of the chat. So if you're, you want these prompts, make sure to click that link. 
There's going to be some other prompts in just a moment as well. You can also use a site called jobscan.co. This is also on the uh, resource guide. You want to copy in your resume, copy in the job description. That is an ATS-like algorithm that can help you calculate, calculate your match rate based on skills, job title, education, all those type of things, right? So make sure to utilize this. They give you free scans when you sign up. And so this can be a really great tool to help you identify some of them as well. Now, one thing we want to talk about with keywords, too, is that you want to use variations of keywords, meaning if you have engineer, you might also want to include engineering or engineered, right? You also want to include location-based keywords. So just like I said, if you're moving to Chicago, Illinois, having Chicago, Illinois in your resume is something you want to think about. Um, and typically, like I said, I focus on the hard skills for your resume. Now, I wanna quickly jump into some things for career changers or people who are changing industries, right? The first thing I wanna tell you to do is that you wanna conduct a skills analysis, meaning you wanna identify and highlight relevant and transferable skills that you currently have. These are the things that you absolutely wanna make sure are highlighted in your resume and that you're gonna utilize to sell yourself inside of an interview. But you also want to identify and develop a plan to, for new skills, right? So we are often going to encounter skills that we may not have when we're changing careers. And we need to develop a plan to acquire some of those skills to make us a better candidate on our job search, right? And so we, once we do that, we make that plan and we start to do those things, you want to make sure that you also showcase your efforts to transition into the new space. Being quite frank with you all, as a career coach and resume writer, there's many people who come to me trying to transition into a space, but they've made no efforts to transition into that space, meaning they haven't gotten any certification or taken any micro, or gotten any micro credentials or did any programs like boot camps, trainings, internships, rotational programs. They haven't done any relevant projects to where they're trying to go. But if you've done any of those things, you wanna make sure that you include them into your document. These are gonna be the things that show a recruiter or hiring manager that you're serious about making that transition. Now, the other thing is, you should use AI to help you in your transition. So I have a couple of prompts on the screen. Once again, they are in the resource guide that Brooklyn put inside of the chat. Um, the first one is going to help you identify the key requirements, including skills, areas of expertise, and systems. And it's going to ask the AI system to review your resume and provide feedback on how to tailor that job, right? The second one, you're telling it that you're transitioning from certain position or industry to another position or industry, and you want it to identify what skills and areas of expertise will be transferable, right? This will help you, once again, identify those transferable skills. And if you see things inside there that you don't have, maybe you can get some of those skills in your current job or your current role or company, and that can help make you a better candidate. And then the last one is going to help you actually identify the keywords and phrases in totality, and it will just list it out for you, right? Now, these aren't the only AI prompts that you can utilize. There's tons of them out there on the internet, but I just wanted to put that on here for you all to look at. Um, now, that's where I'm gonna stop for the moment because we wanna get to some of your questions, but I do have some information on the screen. You can go ahead and scan that QR code if you wanna uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. My email's on the screen, my website's on the screen, and you can get a free 30-minute consultation with me by following that link, bit.ly forward slash LRC consult. It is case sensitive. So make sure the LRC and the C in consult are uh, all capitalized. And then the last thing I'll say, and I'm gonna pass it back to, to my co-host here is, for anybody who's on this call or watches it later, I'm offering you a special discount code of 10% off when you use the code champions. I'm feeling very good, you know, after, after the win, I'm feeling good after the Lions have gotten a playoff win. So we're going to get a little discount code here. Keep champions. This will be good through June 30th, 2024 for anybody who engages with this. So thank you for attending and let's get to some of these questions. I love that. Thank you, Tristan. Um, thanks again. So we're going to jump right in because we had so many questions added in advance and then through our Q&A feature. Again, pop those in if you still have more. Um, but our first question was submitted in advance. It reads, are multiple versions of resumes okay? 
For example, if you're applying for different types of roles at different companies, et cetera. Absolutely, that's a great question. Yes, multiple versions of your resume are okay. In fact, they are encouraged, right? So when we are applying to different jobs, just because they might have the same job title does not mean they're looking for the same exact type of skill set, right? So because I've applied to a project management role, doesn't mean that I sh should use the same exact uh, resume, right? One project management role might be looking for me to know the waterfall methodology. One might be looking for me to know an agile methodology, right? So we want to create documents that highlight the skills that are relevant to the jobs that we're applying to. And in all honesty, while I know most job seekers like to hate, hate to hear this, excuse me, uh, you should be creating a tailored document for almost every single job you're applying for in most cases. Um, but yes, that uh, versions, different versions are absolutely encouraged. Okay, great. And I think you sort of um, answered our next question, which was going to be given the need to tailor resumes, how many resumes ideally should a mid-career level individual have? But I think you're saying they should have one for every job. Yeah, what I would say is if you are mid-career level, you should be pretty focused on two to three job titles at that point in time, right? If you can get very narrowed down to those type of things, I would have at least two to three different versions of my resumes for each one of those job titles. Now, you might need to make some few tweaks here or there for each one of them when you apply, but at least now you have the different versions for those different areas, right? So I'm not saying, yeah, if you don't have the time to create one for every single job, if we get a general one for each one of the categories, and make small minor tweaks, that's going to help you tremendously. Okay, great. I'm going to pop it over to Brooklyn for our next question. Yeah, thanks so much, Tristan. And again, we've had so many questions come in, so we're going to get to, get to as many as we can. Um, so one question that was submitted in advance was, what are some do's and don'ts of applying to the same company again? So whether it was a company mm -hmm. we used to work at or a company that we didn't make it through the first round, um, what are mm -hmm. do you have any recommendations or advice for people? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things I'll say with the don't, if you've worked at this company before, don't believe you are a shoe in simply because you've worked at that company before, right? Don't believe that you're just going to get something out thin air. Um, the other thing is if you if you applied to a company or worked at that company before, um, try to incorporate the language that you know that company uses, right? If they know you are familiar with that space, familiar with the language they use, it makes them a lot easier. To, it makes it a lot easier for them to see you as a great candidate. Now, one of the things I would also recommend if, you, if you've if you worked there before is utilize your resources in the context that you may have. We know that getting referrals into companies make you almost 15 times more likely to land an interview than just applying online. So if you have connections at that company who are willing to either connect you with the hiring manager, the recruiter, or utilize the referral program that that company or organization may have, you have a much higher chance of getting into that space. That's great. Thanks, Tristan. Haley, next question. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we got quite a few questions about um, project work and sort of relevant experience. So, um, and I know you touched a bit on this, but this is a question we received in advance. So if I'm making a mid-career switch after completing a degree program in a new field, how much of my resume should be devoted to my prior work experience versus project work that I've done to support my education, assuming I don't have professional experience in the new field? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. So what I would say is we always still want to showcase our, our prior work. Um, people like to see your work history. What is important here, though, is that you look at the things from your past work history that are transferable to where you're trying to go and focus in on those, right? We, we This isn't a include everything about the job. It's include the things that are relevant to where you're trying to go. And then utilize the rest of the space to focus intently on those projects that are, um, you know, in support of your your education and really make sure you get into what your role was into that in that what tools and systems you were using right all the things that can really help them show you know more about this space than just the education itself right so i would say you still want to include the the previous education we might really get that bare bones to about three three bullet points three four bullet points that are absolutely relevant to the jobs you're trying to get and then focus the rest on the project for you Okay, great. And then as a follow up, we also received this in today's Q&A, but should that project work take the same format as relevant work experience? I believe that it should simply because we need to explain that work and 
by explaining that work, that means you're more than likely going to hit on more keywords or phrases that are relevant to the job you're actually interested in, right? So if we just list the project title and when we did it, no one's gonna really know what that project was, what you did, the systems you used, right? So we wanna go a little bit further. I would format it very similar to an experience section and add bullet points. In. Okay, great. And I have one more question in that in mm -hmm. that chain. So, and this is more on contracting, um, but how would I add contract work to my resume? I have full-time work experience and contract work experience, and I'm not sure how to put both on a resume. Yeah. So there are varying opinions on how to represent this. Most often what I do is I just include it in the experience section itself. Whether it's contract work, full-time work, it's all experience that you've had. Now, one thing that you might want to do, and this is gonna be very situation dependent, you might wanna call that out as contract work or um, whatever the case may be, because some contract work can be for short periods of time. And we know that you know there's some, some stigma sometimes about job hopping. And so if a company or organization organization knows that it's contract work, they understand that it's for a designated amount of time. And that sort of that sort of you know, mitigates any concerns about job hopping and all of that as well. But I don't like to necessarily separate it out because at, at this point in time, it, it, it can sometimes um, help invalidate the experience when in reality, the experience is the experience, right? So I just include it inside of the experience piece with the rest of my full-time experience and then determine if calling it out as contract or not could be beneficial for me at that point. Got it, thank you. Okay, Brooke with mm -hmm. our next question. Yeah, so we had a lot of people in advance submit questions um, that have been out of the workforce for a, few, for a few years and they wanna understand how to best address this in their resumes. Um, I'm going to add a few resources into the chat from different sessions we've done in the past. But Tristan, do you have any resume specific advice for those who are re-entering the workforce after a break? Yes. Now, I know some of the advice that people will get uh, when re-entering the workforce is to move to what's called a skills-based resume or things of that sort. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I speak to recruiters and hiring managers on a regular basis. Um, and in those conversations that I have with them, many of them don't really like to see skills-based resumes, if I'm being quite frank. Um, they, When they see them, they often go, there's something wrong here, right? They're, they, right? It's not what they're used to seeing. It's not It's not in their regular flow. And so oftentimes I think moving to a skills-based resume can actually hurt you a little bit more than it can help you, right? What I tend to look at is being as upfront and honest as I possibly can um, inside of my document. So if my last, I haven't worked in a year and a half because my last where I got laid off, I would actually make the last bullet point in that job uh, a, a, a bullet point that says, you know, position eliminated due to a reduction in force of 500 positions, right? So now they know that you this wasn't to any fault of your own. It was a company reorganization, whatever the case may be. But let's just say you're somebody like a pregnant mom or a mom who took time out to start a family and haven't, hasn't been here for four or five years. I actually just worked on a resume for someone who was very similar. She was in a logistics space. And so what we did is we actually um, created a position in her experience section that said uh, caregiver, right? And it had the dates. And we actually utilized bullet points under there because I told her starting a family and having a baby, it's all logistics. There's logistics all throughout that, right? So we focused heavily on the logistics of her starting and running her family for the last four to five years. And so I think it's an interesting way to show companies, um, you know, okay, this is what's been happening over these years, but I'm even thinking about it in context of what I'm looking to do next, right? So there's always a way to tie the things that you've done or were doing during that time um, the other thing I would say is if, if you've been volunteering a lot during that time, this is when volunteer work should absolutely come on your resume, even if it's not relevant, um, simply because maybe that's been where the majority of your time and bulk of your time has been. And maybe you've even gained some skills that are relevant to where you're trying to go in there. So focus heavily on those when you're describing your volunteer work too. So those are just a couple of examples. But what I would say for some of those people, if you're very interested in figuring out your unique situation, go ahead and set up a 30 minute free consultation with me. You can go to my website, the link is there. We put it in the chat multiple times. Um, it's also in the resource guide and we can talk about your unique situation. Thanks, Tristan. I kept thinking of a few more things I was gonna chime in with, but you covered everything as you kept talking. So <laughs> good, such a thorough good. response. 
Um, Haley, do you want to grab our next question about how far back to go? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this question is from Kristen um, in, in our Q&A. So she asks, many of my most relevant experiences are from years ago. How far back do we go if the experiences are very relevant, but they're from 20 plus years ago? Kristen, thank you so much for asking this question. So I think what this highlights is that there's no one right way to write a resume. There's a lot of things you shouldn't do, right? And we talked about quite a few of those things. And sometimes you sort of have to bend the rules and sort of see what works for you as um, you know, as a potential employee, because all of our situations are different. So for you, Kristen, if your most relevant experiences are from 20 plus years ago, I would probably try to find a way to bring those things into your document. Now, if you just want to focus on the last 10 to 15 year or 10 years in your professional experience, and then you could say maybe an additional relevant experience section to bring in some of those older roles that show that, that's an option. Sometimes you just go straight through on your professional experience. But I do believe that if your oldest roles were the most relevant thing to what you're trying to do now, they are something that you wanna consider potentially bringing on or mentioning because they are the things that are probably gonna help you have the best chance of being seen by that recruiter or hiring manager, right? So um, you want to find an alternative way of bringing it on, but I do think it is something that you can represent here. Okay, thank you, Tristan. Brooke? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to cover just a few quick questions that came in because I know we are at time. It is one o'clock. Um, yeah. I'm also going to be popping um, a survey into the link. If you can all fill that out, let us know how we did today. Um, but first, Tristan, uh, what's the first one here? How many bullet points are ideal under each experience? That's a really great question. I typically stick between about three to max maybe seven. Um, okay. I, it's usually about three to five. If you have to go to six or seven, okay, but I would never go really too much further than that. Um, you know, people are scanning the document. We don't want to provide too much content. Yeah, and in those bullet statements, um, do you recommend full sentences or bullet points? Like short, short, concise, non-full sentences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm more of a full sentence guy, I must I must admit, just simply because it, in those short, concise things, we often take it to simply the task that we did, and we can never get to the context or the value or the results around that. And I think those things are incredibly important. Number one, about hitting the key word, but number two, allowing a recruiter or hiring manager to visualize you doing that work, right? If you say you've implemented a certain type of system by doing X, Y, and Z, and that company's looking to now implement that system in their company and organization, they can better see you doing that work, right? But if you just say implemented accounting system, Systems. Now they're like, mm, okay, I don't, it, I don't really know what system it was or if this is the best candidate, right? So you definitely want to explain a little bit more, I think, inside of those bullets. Okay, and then the final fast question here um, is the tense that we use for those bullet point sentences. Um, I know for past experience, it should be past tense, but for that current role, do you recommend doing the current, the current tense, present tense? Yeah. <laughs> So I, I recommend in the current role, if it is a current activity that you're doing or an ongoing activity, doing the present tense is completely fine. If it is okay. something that you have already completed um, or something that has happened years ago inside of your job, then I would use the past tense at that point in time. So you're probably gonna alternate tenses a bit depending on if it's something you're currently doing or if it's something that happened in the past. Sounds great. And I know we're already at 102. Haley, do you want to end this with our last question of the session? Yes, thank you, Brooke. Okay, so our final question again um, came in advance, but um, so, and it appears to be someone from a hiring manager. Um, so they're asking about red flags they should be on the lookout for in reviewing resumes. I think this is a good question to end on because it also, I think, is important for the job seekers as well. But can you give us just a high level touch on red, red flags, current formatting, keyword do do's and don'ts, just, you know, from both sides, perhaps? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest red flags that I would look for on the employer side um, is the small ways that people simply just try to hide things, right? So like I talked about earlier, um, if someone's just including years on their resume, I would pause and sort of ask like, okay, well, why are you only including those years, right? What were you doing? What are you trying to hide inside of those years, right? Um, when did that actually end? Um, the other thing that I would look out for inside of resumes on the employer side is looking at job titles. Now, it's incredibly normal for someone to normalize their job title, right? So someone might have a job title 
title, this is director of people, and they might normalize it to director of human resources. That's completely fine. But there are some people who might be a re human resource generalist, and then they decide to, you know, etch it, etch it up a bit, right? So look out for those type of things. I do think there are a lot of people who try to fudge those things. But um, on the on the flip side, uh, when we're looking at this, I'm not going to tell a job seeker what to, to look at resume-wise, but what I will tell a job seeker to look at is look at the job description itself. Uh, look at how much in, in, in time you think somebody actually invested in this. How detailed and thorough are this? Are they way too general? One of the things that I also look at is this other duties as a sign, right? I'm very concerned about that statement inside of a job description because that just leaves it very open and vague. So ask questions about those things. Try to get something that's incredibly defined because just as much as job seekers might be trying to make things rather opaque for a job, uh, an employer, employers are also trying to make things rather opaque for job seekers. So question everything inside of that job description and, and make sure that you're covering yourself and knowing what you're getting into. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again. Um, please, everyone, join me in extending a genuine and heartfelt thank you to Tristan Layfield for being with us today. I know we received so many questions. We had such a good conversation. So please, please, I encourage you to um, check out his website, layfieldresume.com. That link should be popping into the chat from Brooklyn. Thank you, Brooke. And again, thank you to Tristan for sharing your time and expertise with your own alumni community. We are so grateful. And we'd like to remind everyone um, that recording of today's session Session will be sent as a follow-up and please use the link shared in the chat to complete our survey and let us know how we did and don't forget to explore our website alumni.umich.edu backslash career so many good resources hopefully we'll answer some of your questions that you have and thanks everyone for joining and go blue go blue thanks for having me thanks everyone